Howdy, welcome to Math 153 Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis. This is the lecture for sections 6.5 and 6.6. So you see these are the last two sections in chapter 6. So let's get into it. The key concept from this section 6.5 on the central limit theorem is that the central limit theorem tells us for a population with any distribution the distribution of the sample means approach a normal distribution as the sample size increases. And the central limit theorem also provides a foundation for estimating population parameters and hypothesis testing, which we'll actually get into in the next couple chapters in the book. Start off with the central limit theorem makes some assumptions. The first assumption is that the random variable x has a distribution with a mean sigma, uh, with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. That distribution for the random variable may or may not be normal, but that's okay. There is a distribution associated with the random variable. The other assumption that's made is that simple random samples, all of the same size n, will be selected from the population. Okay. Once we have these two assumptions in place, okay, then the central limit theorem makes the following conclusions. The first conclusion we get from the central limit theorem is that the distribution of the sample x bar will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution. This is what we've already seen from the previous section. Okay, The more times we roll the dice, the more those sample mean distribution approximated that <coughs> expected value, and that is what and that is what the, the target was for the population parameter. Okay, so the distribution of the sample mean, x bar, will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution, and that's what we saw. The mean of the sample means is the population mean, mu. We also saw that with our dice rolling experiment. And finally, the standard deviation of all sample means is sigma over the square root of n, where n is your sample size. So there's some conventions that come into play when we use the central limit theorem. Okay, First, some commonly used notations in relation to the central limit theorem. As you see here at the top of the screen, the mean of the sample means is represented with mu sub x bar. Okay, Remember that because the mean is an unbiased estimator, that means that the mean value of the sample means is going to approach the mean value of the population, so that the, the two are actually the same. Standard deviation doesn't work that way, but we do represent the standard deviation of the sample means with sigma sub x bar, and this is equivalent to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, the standard deviation of the sample means is also called the standard error of the mean. When we apply the central limit theorem, there are some common rules, or rather rules that are commonly used. The first is that for samples of size n larger than 30, we can approximate the distribution of the sample means reasonably well by normal distribution. Okay, This first, this first rule basically applies to distributions that are not normal to begin with. Okay, so you're looking at a different type of distribution. If the sample size uh, is larger than 30, then we can reasonably approximate the data underneath that distribution with the normal distribution. Because as the sample size n becomes larger, that you know approximation we're making with the normal distribution, uh, it'll become less and less and less of an approximation and more of the actual fact. Now, if the original population is normally distributed to begin with, then there is no you know sample size 30 limit that we have to reach. There has this there's just whatever the sample size is, that's what it is, because we're already normally distributed, okay. So then the sample means will be normally distributed. As I mentioned previously, we already see an example of the central limit theorem in play. We just didn't know this what we were seeing. Okay? 
Remember that if we take the distribution of individual dice, the individual outcome from each of those individual dice that we rolled, and we put that into a distribution, we get a uniform distribution. But as we put the samples into groups of five, which is how we were rolling them, and we begin to collect them as we roll the dice more and more, then that distribution of the samples becomes a normal distribution. And it becomes more and more normal the more we roll the dice, the more samples we put into the distribution. So how can we actually use a central limit there to solve an actual real world problem? Well, let's take a look at an example with elevators. Suppose an elevator has a maximum capacity of 16 passengers and a total weight of 2,500 foot uh, pounds force. So if we assume that the weights of people on the elevator follow a normal distribution with a mean of 182.9 pounds force and a standard deviation of 40.8 pounds force, what is the probability that a randomly selected person will weigh more than 156.25 pounds force? The 156.25 comes by taking 2,500 and dividing it by 16. So we want to know what's the probability that a randomly selected person will weigh more than the average weight that should be carried by a person on the elevator. Well, we've solved this problem before. We can go old school and then convert our random variable into a z-score, use the tables to find the area of the curve, and that gives us the probability. We can be lazy and use software like StackCrunch. And since I'm a lazy engineer, I'm going to take the software approach. So when we plug that in, you see that the probability that we get out is 74.3%. Either way you solve it, you're going to get the same number. Okay, So that's the probability that one person will weigh more than 1 16th of the total capacity. Now if we're going to take the same distribution at the same elevator, and let's ask a different question, okay? What's the probability that a randomly selected sample of 16 people will have a mean weight greater than 156.25? So now we've got 16 people into the mix. This is where the central limit theorem comes, because what we need to do is adjust the distribution that we use to calculate our probability. And the central limit theorem gives us the tools to do that. First, remember that the sample mean is the same as the population mean. So there's no adjustment to be made there. Okay, it's going to stay at 182.9. However, the standard deviation will need an adjustment because the formula for standard deviation required us to divide that population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. So there's 16 people on board the elevator in our problem. So we have to take 40.8, which is our standard deviation, and divide it by the square root of 16. When we do that, we get our new adjusted standard deviation, which is 10.2. Now these are the values that we put in to solve for a problem as we previously done. So putting these values into our distribution, notice I have a mean of 182.9 and a standard deviation of 10.2 and I put in the random variable 156.25 and out pops my answer 99.55 percent. This means the weight capacity of the elevator will almost certainly be exceeded. The probability that 16 people aboard the elevator will have greater than 1 16th of the total weight capacity of the elevator is almost a certainty. So therefore, it's very, very, very likely, it's almost a sure thing, that the weight capacity of the elevator will be exceeded. And I'd hate to be one of the 16 people on board the elevator when that cable snaps or whatever it is that breaks and the elevator starts coming down to the ground. There's a correction that we need to make for finite populations. So when we have a sample without replacement, as we just saw with a sample size n, and that sample is less than 5% of the larger finite population size, capital N, then we're going to calculate standard deviation of the sample means using the formula we just used. However, 
in the same case, everything's the same except that our sample size is greater than 5% of the finite population size, then we need to adjust with a finite population correction factor, as you see here. So we're going to take and we're going to take the same formula we have before, but we're going to tack on another multiplier there on the end, square root of capital N minus little n over capital N minus 1. This corrects for additional bias that you get as you get greater and greater sample size with standard deviation. So that's pretty much all there is to the central limit theorem. So the final section in chapter 6 is about assessing normality. So let's dive into it. What we're going to look at are criteria for determining whether the requirement of a normal distribution is satisfied. And, and this is actually something that we looked at before, back in chapter 2, when we were learning about histograms. Basically, a normal quantile plot is a graph of plots where you know, each x value is from the original data set. So those are essential random variables. And then the, the y values are the corresponding z-scores. Z now, the plot that you see here, the normal quantile plot, is also referred to as a normal probability plot. In essence, the x values are the random variables from our distribution. And the y values are z-scores that correspond to those random variables. So for all the random variables in our distribution, what we did is we just converted each of them to a z-score to get a corresponding y value that we could then plot x and y coordinates on a graph. To evaluate a distribution for normality, there's a three-step process. The first, pro the first step is to construct a histogram. This allows us to see if the distribution has a general bell shape. Okay? If we don't see that generalized bell shape, there's no point in going on any further because we're just going to fail the test. So we, we can just go ahead and stop here. However, if we see a general bell step, then the next step is to identify any outliers. And you can usually spot these in a histogram. Now, you want to stop here if you have more than one outlier, okay? Because having multiple outliers can influence the shape of a distribution. So we want to make sure that the normal shape that we're seeing is actually not from the influence of too many outliers. So if you have more than one outlier, just go ahead and stop here. You're, you're going to fail the test. Of course, if you meet those first two offenses, then you can just go to the third step, which is construct a normal quantile plot. This is very easily done in StatCrunch. Keep in mind that the plots must reside reasonably close to a straight line in order to pass the test. And the patterns of the points must resemble the pattern of a straight line. Let's look at an example of how this might look. So if we have a normal distribution to start out with, then this is a distribution that should pass the test. And when we make a histogram, say we see something like this. Well, this has a general bell shape to it. Starts low, goes high to about the middle, and then comes back down low again. So there's a general bell shape here. And there are no outliers in the distribution. So we've met the first two requirements. Now let's go to the third, make our normal quantile plot, and see how the plot, the, the, the points in this plot actually more or less follow the straight lines you see there in red. That's what we want to see when we're wanting to have a normal distribution. That's what we should see. Generally follow a straight line. For a uniform distribution, the points in a normal quantile plot will follow a sinusoidal line. So let's say we have a normal distribution to start out with instead of a, instead of a normal distribution. Okay, We're going to get a histogram that looks something like this, where all the random variables have approximately the same value. There are no outliers on this histogram, but we don't see that general bell shape. So if we wanted, we could stop right here. But let's say we wanted to go further and make the normal quantile plot anyway. Well, if we did that, it would look something like this. Okay. Notice that with uniform distributions, when you make the normal quantile plot, there's an S pattern to the points in the normal quantile plot. So what we have here is a general sort of an S shape. And I don't draw lines very well because I'm not an artist, I'm an engineer. But you can see kind of the sinusoidal S shape that's made with the lines as we go through. This actually S pattern will get more pronounced as you have more data underlying your distribution. But it's something that, that is clearly not what we want to see with a normal quantile plot. 
What if we have a skew distribution to start out with? Well, a histogram of a skew distribution will look something like this if it's skewed to the right. I can never get over this. It's like skew distribution to the right. It's like, well, all the data is on the left side of your graph. I still can't get over that. But I got to remember, look at the tail of the distribution. Where's that larger tail at? It's on the right, so therefore it's skewed to the right. Anyway, this is what a histogram would look like for a skewed distribution, skewed to the right. There's no outliers here again, but we don't see that general bell shape. So right here we can just say, okay, enough. We don't need to do anything more. But what if we wanted to do more? We could make a normal quantile plot. It would look something like this. And usually with a skewed distribution, you can tell this from the normal quantile plot. Notice how the curve line the points make in a normal quantile plot doesn't follow that straight line that we see there in red. So if we were to like trace the general path of the lines together, we get something that looks like this. And oftentimes, the more skewness you have in your histogram or your distribution, the more sharply this, this bend is going to be in your normal quantile plot. Now, we do need to understand a little bit about data transformations before we round up. So there are many data sets that don't have a normal distribution, and that's where data transformations come in. Because we can transform the data by modifying its values so that it does have a normal distribution. One of the most common trans transformations that's made is to just take each random variable, add one, and then take the natural log, I mean, take, excuse me, take the base 10 log of that sum. So this is what we would call a log normal distribution if the resulting values conform to a normal distribution because we took the logarithm of the random variables to produce a normal distribution. Logarithms aren't the only way we can transform data. We can also, you know, do a myriad of different things. I mean, the sky is the limit, really. Uh, some common ones you see listed here on the screen, screw root of x, uh, you can take the reciprocal, 1 over x, or you can square and get x squared, okay? Lots of different types of data transformations you can make. The point is, is that we want that normal distribution because that then unleashes the tools that we've already learned about in Chapter 6 for evaluating probabilities, percentiles, and then finding random variables for a given distribution if we want, if we're given the actual probability to start out with. So that's all we have in this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Otherwise, I will see you in class. Thanks for watching.